Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to our joint webinar with TATSOFT, Designing an Edge to Cloud Architecture for IIoT. It is a pleasure to have you all. I am super excited to introduce you all to our speakers for today, Ian Skerritt, who is Head of Marketing at HiveMQ, and Mark Takolini, who is the founder and CTO of TATSOFT. Uh, joined by Ian and Mark are Harry McCollum, uh, Dave Hellier and Eric uh, from Tatsoft, uh, who will be helping with the Q&A and the demo. Uh, before we get started with the session, I would like to share a couple of housekeeping pointers we would be following. Uh, the session is recorded and will be shared at a later point in a follow-up email. If you have any questions during uh, the session, feel free to ask them in the Q&A box in the control panel, and please refrain from using the chat, uh, chat panel. Um, and then we also have a dedicated 15, minute, uh, 15 minutes of Q&A uh, after the presentation. And if you have any unanswered questions, uh, please send us an email over. And lastly, we'll be running a poll uh, during the Q&A and a survey right after the session. Uh, kindly request you all to participate and provide feedback. And without further ado, I will um, hand it over to Mark. Mark, you can uh, take over the presenta presentation now. You can start okay. sharing the screen. Well, uh, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for you all uh, here. So let me uh, share my screen. And let's go for it. <laughs> so uh, we are going to talk uh, today as uh, to do an architecture from the edge to the cloud and leveraging a lot in top of uh, the new technologies provided by HeavenQ. But before we start on that, some basic background about us, okay? Our company is based in Houston, Texas, and Chicago, and was created based in many decades of experience. And from the very beginning, uh, we work uh, with uh, OG and IT technology. So that's what we do. And uh, we created a new platform for corporate all based in no legacy code. So we leverage technology like cross platform development, so you can develop in Windows, deploy in Linux, and the system was designed to be easy to use as to OEMs and brand labels. Our core product is called a framework, and I'll explain a little bit what is that platform to create real-time applications. Uh, essentially, in one simple slides, uh, we try to solve all the connectivity to the factory floor with more than seven connection uh, custom protocols, very easy integration to store in databases, very advanced dashboarding and graphical packaging, and easy connection to your ERP. So from that chart, you can think about framework as an enabling technology to create custom solutions where you need to do that connection, aggregation, and visualization. And we do have some analytics as well, but mainly for analytics and ERP, we have the connections with touch uh, path systems. Uh, the way we deploy the platform, uh, it's a single development environment we call frameworks. And from that environment, you can deploy a low end edge HMI, IoT gateways to data acquisition and local UI at the factory or at the machine level, as well uh, on the enterprise environments with framework and limited. You can have hundreds of thousands of tags. So we supply both sides, the edge devices publish the data to the enterprise applications and as well the enterprise application. And the idea of our platform, all your typical requirements on graphs, alarming, events-driven notifications, OPC, 
custom interfaces, custom codes, is out of the box in one single tool. So the idea is you don't have to go <laughs> cut and paste man applications. The idea of framework is to able to have a complete tool set from only one package. And before we go uh, in details on the architecture, let's review a little bit where we came from, at least the way I think for me it's useful to do that. So a little bit for our own history, so you understand where I came from. I'm working with that kind of system for uh, three decades. So we started in 1986. Uh, and since then, we have the opportunity to follow many changes in the market in operation platforms and concepts that are used. And so I'm very happy that some of the tools we created around the year 2000, they are still active products in the market nowadays for brand labels. But in 2009, we decided to start the life of the FastSoft frameworks, and that's our roadmap the last few years, to create a new platform because it was our understanding uh, to be able to accomplish the proper architecture for that edge to cloud, the 4.0, the IoT, it was necessary to redo that from scratch. Uh, and here, going back uh, to the history, but now from the point of view of data, why was that? Okay, if you are old enough as I am, you remember that in the eight we start to put some organization around much buzz and register. It was the first more or less open structure. Then, of course, that quickly evolved to the concept of tag-based addressing, data templates, many other standards were created. And that evolved later to do applications that are asset-centric. But when we start to deploy those applications, one of the big limitations that start to happen, you, you cannot bring all your data to only one tool, one package, and from there do everything. So this architecture had to evolve to a system where you can have the data distributed across many applications. So essentially, uh, the new concept a modern edge to cloud architecture need, needs to comply are that we use a lot the concept of defining spaces on the implementation of that. But some of the, all those items are important, but the ones highlighted are really very critical. So a modern architecture should be using open technologies so you can interchange the components, not try to do everything your enterprise needs with only one vendor that will not be possible and very important to allow that distributed storage as we're going to see in our demo but allowing the distributed storage at the same time avoid duplication of data so we will explore a little bit more in both the demo that concept of distributed data stewards where you have your main asset model, your namespace, but piece and parts of the namespace, they are dynamically uh, got from different applications. When you try to implement that architecture with all those requirements, the MTGT broker technology is perfect because it was redesigned for that. So the basic uh, organization you do, uh, you have the broker as the main entity, but on top of the broker, you add our set of edge connectivity and the data transformation. So uh, all the name normalization and all the other things you need to properly send the data to a broken process, that's the part our framework will uh, enable. So with that infrastructure, all the goals to implement they are that blue line at the top <laughs> that will be your final goal that starts with a good data organization 
uh, in the data acquisition architecture. That's what we're going to explore in this presentation. And because the uh, broker is such an important component, uh, uh, we decide to do that partnership with HiveMQ to make easy to our customers to have a professional enterprise high performance broker when uh, doing uh, that architecture. And essentially starting with version 9.2, when we install our product, we install by default a HiveMQ broker. Even without license, you can do right away 25 MQT clients and you have upgrade to very large systems. So I'm very happy because uh, that easy integration, both tech and commercial to a uh, high top level broker, it's essentially to really simplify the applications we are starting to do now. So with that, I'll give uh, the word to Jan to talk a little bit more about Hive and Kill. <clears throat> Great. Well, th thank you, Mark. And, and we're really excited about um, the partnership that, that we have with, with Tatsoft and, and kind of uh, talking about how we can kind of jointly kind of add value to, to their, their, our customers. Um, so just a, a few words about uh, HiveMQ. Um, so, so Mark, can, I'm, I'm, you're still presenting. So um, so if you can kind of keep, keep me in presentation mode, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, um, so for, 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 so HiveMQ is a, a, a German based uh, company. We're just based outside of, of Munich. We've been around since uh, 2012. Um, really been focused on on HiveMQ um, since around 2014. And really what HiveMQ is all about is we help um, companies connect devices. So be a device could be a piece of factory equipment. It could be a, a solar farm. It could be a connected car. And we help them to connect those devices to the cloud and or to your data center and we move the help them move the data between the devices and and the cloud and but also more importantly we, we move data from the cloud back to the devices and we do this and this is really key for our customers we do this in an efficient fast and reliable manner and i also might add in a secure manner um, and that's really kind of the, the key why people come to us. We have a number of, of, of customers um, in production today um, that um, have been using Hive and Few for, for many years and been very successful with that. Ne next slide, please, uh, Mark. So where we where we really focus on um, from from a key, an industry perspective is is four key industries. Um, two which are really applicable for for our conversation today. Uh, in in Kind of in connected car and mobility. Um, so if you buy a BMW or an Audi today, all the connectivity from the car to the cloud and from the cloud back to the car is done through, through HiveMQ. So we really scale into millions of, of connected devices. <clears throat> we have a lot of customers um, and a lot of interest in the manufacturing industrial automation area. And as probably many people on, on this call know, that there's a lot of investment going into how you break down the data silos, how you get, get a consistent data format. Um, so you can do things like predictive maintenance um, and, and kind of use, use historians in a consistent manner. Um, and, and Mark's going to do some really nice demonstrations of that um, la later on. Um, transportation and logistics is, is a key. Connected assets is also a key. Um, kind of the, the demo Mark's going to do is around solar panels, um, which is a great example of a connected asset. Um, but how do you connect kind of, uh, kind of oil and gas, renewable energies, um, <clears throat> whatever you have that and connect and remotely remote management of, of those assets. Those are some of the key industries that, that we focus in on. Next slide, please, Mark. <clears throat> So why do people come to us? Um, and, and these are the kind of, the, there's really six key challenges customers tip, typically have when they, when they come to, to, to talk to HiveMQ. Um, and the first one is really, I think the, 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 the critical one. Um, our customers are building business critical systems. Um, and so reliability, high availability is paramount for them. Um, they wanna make sure they're, they're not losing data. Um, they wanna make sure that their systems um, always working. Um, and that's that's kind of one of the key value statements that, that we have. Um, so if, if you're running a, a system through a, an MQT broker and that broker is going down, that could take your factory down. 
right? Or that could take your your uh, kind of asset management system down, and and that that's not good for your for your business. Scalability. Um, we talked about kind of scalability in millions of cars. Um, the scalability is also millions of messages, kind of lots lots and lots of messages. So how do you have a broker that can handle um, very very high throughput of, of messaging? Cost efficiency of connectivity is very important, certainly for, for kind of things like solar farm management. Um, if you're going through a, 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 a cellular network or a satellite network even, um, network band work is, is always important. Um, MQT, I think, has a very good solution for, for that. And then security is always important. Um, and and HiveMQ has got a very good, good story around uh, end to end security. Um, one thing people often kind of worry about is when you deploy an IoT system, um, how do you troubleshoot? How do you um, debug a, a client that might not be behaving properly? Um, in HiveMQ, we've got a good solution for that. Would kind of we provide the observability that you really need um, for, for deploying an IoT system? And finally, how do you integrate your data? Um, into existing systems, um, and we'll, we'll, we can talk a bit, bit about that in in, um, in in the next slide. So, so next slide. <clears throat> so, so HiveMQ is what we call an enterprise MQT platform. Um, at the heart of the platform is is the MQT broker. Um, so HiveMQ at the core is an MQT broker, but we run that broker. We can run that broker in a clustered environment. So basically, you can run multiple instances of that that. Uh, of that broker running in parallel, very transparent to the, the end devices. The end devices think it's just one broker, but the advantages of, of the, the cluster environment is one of those instances goes down, the, 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 cl the other cluster nodes can take over um, and ensure there's no data loss, ensure there's, there's continuity of, of service there. So that's the key and the very powerful feature that, that we provide with, with HiveMQ. We also have a, what we call the control center. Um, the control center is really our dashboard. It allows you to monitor the, the, the broker, but also more importantly, it also allows you to, to monitor the, each individual client and understand the status of each individual client. Um, and this is where you can get the observability to do troubleshooting, to do debugging of, of, your, of your system. And finally, we have this, uh, we have an enterprise SDK. So you're able to write um, extensions that run within the broker to, for instance, connect to different enterprise services or OT services. So we actually provide a, a Kafka extension. So if you want to, to forward your, your OT data directly into Kafka, we have that capability through, through the HiveMQ Kafka extension. Um, but the flexibility is, is really key for many of our customers that are building out large scale IoT systems um, that have kind of different services that, that need to be integrated. So HiveMQ runs on many of the popular cloud platforms, AWS, um, Azure, but we can also run on in-house um, cloud platforms or data centers. You can run on Kubernetes, you can run on OpenShift, a um, lot, lot of flexibility in, in terms of the deployment. So that's that's um, kind of a very quick overview of, of, of HiveMQ. We'll happy to, to answer questions um, in the Q&A, um, but I'll turn it back to, to Mark to, to take us through, through the demonstration. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so let me uh, start in sharing my uh, screen again. Okay. Uh, so uh, what we decide to do uh, is uh, show a complete architecture uh, from edge uh, to the cloud, but first starting addressing a typical problem that we have in industrial automation that in some other areas they do not happen. In many cases, you can have the edge device publishing data directly to MQT broker in the cloud. But industrial automation, uh, that's not uh, common necessarily because two reasons. Number one, most of the devices that are deployed, they don't support MTTT directly. So we have more than 70 communication protocols to allow you to do that data transformation, 
not only on protocol, we need to normalize the data. So we need to do some processing typically in the factory floor. And there is another problem of the isolation of the network. Not going in too much detail of the Purdue model right now, but we can call generically those three first layers as the process control network. And what does happen typically in the factory floor, they don't allow a direct connection between the process control network, the PCN, and the business network where typically most of your uh, databases are and lots of the enterprise applications willing to consume that data, they, they will be. So we have uh, a part of our infrastructure, uh, this optional secure layer that you call the app application gateway. It's like creating a level 3.5 network out of the box. So we just install the software gate and it allows to move the data from the edge uh, through the proper firewall protections, uh, respecting uh, the network security for critical infrastructure and make the data from the edge to land in the MQT broker or eventually even uh, directly in some other uh, database, SQL databases or historian tools teaching on the level four. So the four key components for your architecture are the edge application publishing the data. In some systems, you are going to have security gateway. The broker, the HiveMQ broker, that is the real-time central hub uh, for your namespace. And we can provide also another application sitting on the top of the real time data for the visualization and work the data at the enterprise level. So if I pick up only the software components, so you have a more clear view, I decide to do a very simple project. So we'll give the resources later. So we'll be able to install all those components in one single machine or one single virtual machine. So we'll be able to test this complete scenario. And the way we lay out the demo to be simple enough for you to be able to reproduce very easily in your own system. Uh, we put uh, in this case only three main components. We create an application that the Tatsoft Edge application, this project configuration here, getting data from Modbus and OPCUA, organize the data and send up. We put also a MTTT possible B simulator, publishing data directly to HiveMQ, so we can show that the broker as the main unified namespace of our application, you combine the data from different data sources. In some cases, it will be our edge application. In some cases, you have devices publishing directly to the broker. And for this scenario, we also create an enterprise level application. So what that enterprise level is up doing. It's subscribing data from the enterprise broker to store in a SQL. In this case, we just did SQL story, but the same concept applies for using Canary, Pile, any other storing database tool. Okay. And the enterprise level applications is also putting data out in different graphical technologies, web pages, .NET clients and showing also how easily you can get data from the broker, do some data aggregation or some analysis and publish data back to the broker. So that's the uh, workflow of the data uh, in the application you build. And when you did that application, we try to leverage a lot the Spark B specification. So we build the, appli the application. So if you add or remove cities, assets, uh, the application is what we call nowadays self-aware application, uh, meaning 
the application react to the data model. So if you add more kids, you add more devices, you, you, don't, you don't need to do any programming at all, okay? So uh, let's take a look in some uh, real display <laughs> to be more uh, uh, interesting, okay? So essentially, uh, save us time, what I did here, I already put those two applications running. Uh, the bulk monitor is the main application that when we start, we put the edge application to run. So essentially, those are the two little project configurations that's making uh, uh, the magic to happen. And here you have another view of the data flow that's happening. Uh, the Hive MQ broker is the main component, receiving data directly from the simulator and also receiving data from our edge system that routes the data from the controllers. And another application at a higher level that is this screen that I'm showing here, interacts with the broker to do some store and to some why and publish that uh, back some data. And here are some examples on that user interface. And one thing that you see that's very interesting, you can very easily do the similar interface, whatever you are doing as here, I'm running HTML5, or you can also have a similar interface in uh, .NET Think Line. So you can, the selection, in fact, the same project in this case, publishing data uh, to different type of users. And as I was explaining, uh, those features, some of them are came from uh, the simulator, some of them are came from the PLC, but to the user on the end of the day, it doesn't matter because what you see to be pretty much uh, the models. Uh, and one point that's interesting, as I was explaining, the application is aware, reacts to the data. So when you are looking at seats that has five panels or when you switch your seat you have two panels, whatever is uh, your data model and the UI, the system reacts automatically from the data model. As well, the data aggregation. Uh, in this application, uh, the application is reading at the dynamically how many assets I have and doing the calculation. So both the calculation, the aggregation, the UI, everything here will react to whatever assets are added or removed dynamically uh, from this application. And instead of showing uh, graphs, maps, and beautiful animation map, what I really would like to explore a little bit is what's behind the scenes to create that application. Uh, because the goal here is not to show beautiful graphics. <laughs> uh, you can do that in PowerPoint. The really here is how to set up a reactive application like that with very simple few steps. That's really the main intention for putting out that little demo. So let's see exactly what, what are those steps. So uh, to do that, I go back to that screen to have that statue. So the first key component is the edge application. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to open this edge project, which is this one here. And hopefully, even if you're not familiar with our configuration tool, you'll be able to understand the simple steps that were necessary to create that application. Uh, the first one, we create our solar panel template uh, with what I have for that. And then we create a little object model <laughs> uh, with some features uh, that will be uh, uh, what will be intent to publish in that case. And because we use arrays and templates, the data model is very simple. It's only those two lines and those arrays can be dynamic by the way. But essentially here we create the data model we intend to publish to the unifying space. 
The next step was on the devices to do the data connection. So we have two data connections reading data, Modbus and OPC way. And of course, instead of being only Modbus or OPC way, you can pick up any one of our 70 protocols or any one of the 250 that we have expertise, but we're not publishing the product. But pretty much what this interface is doing, uh, if I go to points, it's just routing the data properly. So I'm going to organize that for notes so it would be better to understand. As I'm ex I, as you explained, this level is doing the data normalization because when you reach data from Modbus, you need to put in the proper context. When you need data, even from OPC way, not necessarily the OPC way, is organized as you want to have our models. So in this uh, little configuration, we are doing the data normalization and also some scaling by the way of the data. If you want more advanced scaling, you could do in scripts that you can do C sharp, VB.net, or Python calls around your data. In this case, it was a simple, a simple organization. We did just that. After I have the data model, I just need to publish through the MTTT Sparkly protocol. So here I'm publishing my five assets to the proper topic according to the unified namespace specification. So that's a concept for another presentation, but the organization of the namespace, that concept of unified namespace are important when you go to that kind of application. And you see the data is smart enough to understand the concept of templates. So when I'm putting here a GC to Lisbon uh, to be published to this topic, I'm putting all the data structure for the panel. So the configuration of the edge is just that, okay? If all I want to do is move the data. And in some protocols, you don't even need to put one by one in the mapping. If you work with equipment like control logic, that they have the concept of templates, you can just read one template and write to another one. So let's keep moving. Uh, that's the edge application. So the edge gets the data, playing with the data and sending up, sending to the broker. So we saw this piece of the workflow in 10 lines of configuration. Let's see now this application that's doing the UI and doing the analytics, how that application was created. So it's this application here. If you, if you run our demos, if you right click the product, you can run the demos if you install the product. Uh, but let's see uh, how simple or complex, and I hope you find simple <laughs> to do uh, that kind of application. Uh, so the front end application, if I go here to my asset model, my objects, you see I don't have Panels. I don't have solar panels here. I don't have. I only have this one that I'm going to show later. Is for my analytics, but I don't have any data here because we are using the new concept of dynamic tag providers. The dynamic tag providers is great when you do the top of the hierarchy applications. On the publisher, on the end, you need to find the data structure because you need to know what to publish. But when we are consuming data, we have this new feature of dynamic tag provider that when you define a data source, in that case, my data source is a HiveMQ broker, I can browse, browse the object without doing any tag configuration, any mapping. I will, will just dynamically be able to see whatever is defined in the broker with no configuration, no programming for that. And when we do the displays in this application, we do base it to that asset model that is dynamic. So to be clear, if you're familiar with HMI and SCADA, that you are our creating tags, 
with this feature, you don't create tags. You just use your data right away without having to create tags at all in the application. So let's see uh, how uh, the mesh works in some displays. If I go to this display here uh, to give an idea on how uh, those displays were created, that you have here the main stitches and you can open a pop-up when the seat is selected or uh, then you go to this kind of view. Uh, let's see how you can leverage the cost of namespace to do very easily that, that kind of application. If you go to our drawing tools, uh, and I show you, uh, by the way, we create two versions of the UI. One is going to deploy pure HTML5, and one is going to deploy uh, as a .NET string client. Uh, but they are pretty much the same concept. So to do the asset selection is a built-in element <laughs> that you expose an asset model. You can put some filters on what kind of data are going to show from the asset model, and then you have your selected assets. Uh, then when you do uh, uh, other displays like the pop-up, okay, you just do the displays to be generic. So instead of mapping to specific assets, you map to the properties you know that asset is expected to have. And with a very uh, simple uh, two lines of code, you map your asset to the selected asset from the Y. Uh, so this entire application, I will not go on the, in all the details now because it's not a training, but pretty much all the UIs were created dynamically. And when you run the application, we pick up, okay, what I am looking for in the tree. I'm looking a full seat, you'll be this one. If I pick up one specific panel, you map to this one. And all that just a dynamic binding based on the selected assets. And how about the calculation? Let's see. How is the calculation done? So if I go here to my application, to my asset analytics test that I put run every 10 seconds, you need to know a little bit of either C sharp or VB.net, but uh, very basic because essentially what I'm doing, I'm asking to see all the children from my production data. So I'm getting all the attributes, all members I have in my production data. The production data, to remind you, is that dynamic connection to the broker. So in this one line of code, you are requesting all the members in that subset of the tree. In this case, everything under group ID1. And then we just go to the many properties. I'm looking for power, current, and voltage to, to do the calculation of the totals or to do the calculation of the averages. And that's, that one page of line work doesn't matter if I have one asset or 100 assets. And then what I do, I put that result in this local variable, tech.analysis data, and using devices here, analysis data, I publish this topic back to the broker. So this address, analytics.data, if I go to see, uh, to browse, you see the broker here, the group ID is published by the edge and the simulator. And this analytics nodes uh, in the HiveMQ was created by the top level application that did that calculation and publish back to the broker because a nice concept <laughs> the good Walker Reynolds repeats that all times <laughs> you want to do the UI not putting calculation in the screen when you have that thing the best architecture is to run the analytics put back on the broker and have the broker to be uh, the central point to everything, okay? 
And the last thing, so I give a training 10 minutes to archive that data on the start. And by the way, in our case, it's only one line of configuration. In this case, I'm asking to pick up from group IG down everything from production data and save to a SQLite story. The concept will be the same if it's Canary Lab. So uh, other than drawing beautiful symbols, you see we could do uh, this uh, entire configuration uh, really uh, very uh, quickly uh, just by uh, showing uh, those uh, interfaces. So let me uh, stop sharing so we can have a face-to-face -face here <laughs> and uh, go uh, back to questions. But before we open for questions, I think we'd like to talk about those resources. Yeah, so um, it will kind of we can so there's a, we've got a lot of resources that people can do to to learn about more. Um, Jayashree, I think you want to start a poll too when when we start the Q and A. Is, is that correct? We have a, a quick a short poll um, for for people to to um, um, we ask you to complete right as we go through some of the questions. So. Um, so, so thank you, Mark, for, for a great uh, demo and presentation. Um, we've got lots of good questions um, coming up, so I'm just going to start to go through some of these um, with, with, with people. Um, so the first question was, is having queue deployed at the edge? Um, so it can be de um, deployed at the edge or, or in the data center. Um, the, the demo that, that Mark was showing was, would be, I would consider that would be in the data center. We do have um, many customers that will deploy Hive and Q in each factory, so kind of at the edge, right? Um, coordinating the, the, the clients within the factory, and then they'll bridge um, to a data center broker. Um, so, what's called, so you can actually bridge brokers together. Um, so, um, so, yeah, so, so I, I think it's it, kind of the quick answer is you can do both. Mark, this one's going to be more for you. Um, does your edge gateway convert Modbus to Spark plug B, B, Spark plug B or it uses the data model from input protocol and put it on an MQT message? I mean, for example, for Modbus, is the content of MQT is still a Modbus packet or is it converted to Spark plug? Can you help yeah, us with that, Mark? Uh, yeah, the call was breaking a little. Uh, if Eric or Dave can take that well, I could not. <laughs> Get the question very well. So, um, so, so, Dave, are, are you able to help with this? So, so <laughs> I, I, I really think Eric would be would be the best to answer this one directly. Okay. Eric, Eric? Hey, I, 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 yeah, uh, oh. I, I, I'm gonna see here on the theory here. Is that the add gate to convert to the bus? Yeah, the the gate with one piece of the gate, the the edge project. Read the device using the protocol Modbus. Okay, In the other side of the project, he uses the protocol MQTT Spark Plug B to communicate with the, the broker or with any other software that communicate MQTT. Okay, so so I, so, so I think the answer is you, you convert it to the the Modbus payload to a Spark Plug B payload and and send it send it northbound. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, and so, Erica, I think this is probably for you. How 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 does this simulation platform can be used for automotive application to monitor sensor data? <clears throat> so, Mark, Mark, Mark you want to to share uh, talk about that? They want to know if we, we can use this this platform, this architecture in the Automated application, automobile <laughs> application. Yeah, your 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 simulation platform. So I don't know if the fit mark is not here anymore. So I'm gonna answer that as well. Uh, well, in the, uh, it doesn't matter what is the the area for that, the application for that, because in the in the bottom of the side. The bottom of the architecture have the sensor, or we have the field device. Okay, and this monitor sensor, you talk 
with depends on the protocol with the edge project and the edge product you, you talk with the the MQTT. So it doesn't matter what is the the application. This that it's like a generic application, okay? Because you can read the sensor from the the, uh, the automobile project or any other kind of project and send the data to the the having the queue the broker. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Eric. Um, so another question for 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 you, Eric or, or Mark, if you if you can hear us now, um, is there an API for connecting to centralized monitoring? Well, in in this demo, we don't use any API. Okay, is everything is built in in the product? Okay. Um, but but do you have a? Is there a potential to have an API? Like if someone yeah, wanted to, we, we have we have some API that, that, that you can use to com communicate with other softwares. Okay, <laughs> but in that in specific demo, you don't use that. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so, um, how many edge device? How do you manage edge device edge device provisioning when talking about more than two to three devices? Well, in the edge project, you have the the devices that you can create many channels for that. Each channel can communicate for different uh, protocols, okay? So the softwares are able to, to work with one or, the, or two or three device, different device, okay? So that's working exactly the same way, okay? It's just a little configuration. You say this, this channel is for the, let's say the Modbus, would communicate with this device. This channel is for OPC way. He communicate with this device. Okay, so that's in the in the edge project configuration. You say what is the device you want to communicate, but everything is transparent for for us. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're just going to kind of keep on going through these. Some great questions coming in. Um, so do we build two separate applications for thick and or thin, or the final application will be a web application? Let so me read it. let me read it again here. Let me understand that. Do we build two separate applications for thick client and thin, or the final application will be a web application? It, it could be any of the combination of the above. Really, it's when you're divine, when you're creating your application, you can say that it's going to be a an IIoT class application, uh, something that's running even in uh, in Linux. But then also when you're building your displays, you can decide is is this a display that's going to be accessed strictly by the uh, the .NET client base, you know, the .NET clients that we provide, which. Uh, our smart client is, is the thin clients. It uses the Microsoft Click Once technology. So it's there when you need it. It's not there when you don't. But when you also create a display, um, it can be viewed in a, in a browser as well. And so um, it, different ways of creating displays, we're not, we don't limit you to one. It really depends on how, uh, what's gonna best fit your needs and your architecture, uh, your infrastructure. Great, thanks, Dave. Um, so, is there's a question: Is there uh, any trial versions available? Um, I know from HiveMQ, we we have a trial version of our broker that you can download from from our website. Um, it's limited to twenty five client connections. That that's the only limit to it. Um, so, um, Dave, maybe you could help sure. for for um, on, for tats on, the tats off, on the tats off side. If you just go to our website, which is www.tatsoft.com and you um and you uh in the upper right hand corner you'll see a little button that says try our new demo or try a, a download demo just uh go ahead and fill in the information there and we'll send you a link and you'll be able to download a demo version uh, which is the uh, full tool set gives you 500 uh, io points you can work with um it runs uh it gives you 30 days of development time to for evaluation purposes 
uh, which can be extended if needed. But then it also gives you two hours of runtime. So each time you go to run your project, it'll run for two hours and then it'll shut down. And if you need to run it again, you can go ahead and do so for another couple hours and so on. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is part more on the, the application development. Can we inject dynamic JavaScript library like React.js for the HTML5? Well, uh... We support the JavaScript, okay? So in the file that you use to show is, is available to that. So yeah, you can use it ever you want into this, this code. Okay. Um, is there any new information about the custom, the use of custom TLS certificates on the client side? So the broker need to validate the certificate. Um, I think so. This from a, from having group perspective, um, you can use certificate um, authentication for sure. We actually have a um, an extension, a security extension that helps with the workflow with that. Um, so, but no, absolutely, you can do that. You can do it for authentication and and for for authorization if you want, want to limit the topic structure, kind of the access to different topic structures. You can do that from an authorization perspective. <clears throat> Um, is the story deployed at the edge too? So, um, Mark, I'm not sure if you can hear us. Can we bring you back in, into here or maybe not? Okay. So Eric, Eric or Dave, can you help? Is the story deployed at the edge too? He, yes, can be. Okay. It, it, it can be for sure. It yeah. doesn't have to be, but it can be definitely. Yes. Okay. So with the with the edge gateway, which is our data migration tool, which was at the bottom of that stack that where Mark was showing the um, the, the different software products, um, that's called the edge gateway, and that's used to connect to the data and then move it to a database or to the historian, which could be locally, it could be on another computer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, someone was asking about the, will the registration link be available later? Um, I think, um, I think, yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll make sure that everyone gets, um, uh, the links to kind of where you can get kind of a, the free trial versions, um, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, sorry. So lots of great questions. <clears throat> I guess the, the question, so someone came back with, with a clarification on the, the device provisioning. Um, uh, he was referring to managing hundreds of gateways. So I think the question is, if you've got many, many gateways in your, in your overall system um, and you need to provision kind of additional gateways, um, how does Tatsoft handle that? I think that's probably going to be a better answer from Eric or from Mark than it would be for me at this point. Okay. But Okay. Eric, if you could answer that one. Sorry, which one? For, for device provisioning. So if you've got many, many gateways, like 100 gateways in your system, and you want to add a new new gateway, how does Tatsoft handle that? Oh, let me just see it here. I'm reading here as well, just a second. Okay. How about we 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 kind of um, um, kind of go go on to yeah? Can, can I answer that? Sure. Yeah. Well, when you configure a product, you were able to configure the da data provider for that. Okay. The data provider for that, uh, he he was able to to resolve that. Okay. So we just needed to to configure what is the broker for that. And everything that is, is configured is, is coming from the, the broker you show automatically in the project. So the, the data provider resolves that automatically. You don't need to worry about that, okay? Okay, um, so I'm, I'm hoping that that will, will answer the question. Um, so uh, lots of time, Connect, the connectivity gets poor or no connection. How do you store the data so that when your device retains the connectivity, um, it streams the data back to the broker via, via the gateway? Um, 
I'll, I'll start. So kind of in, in general, um, a spark bug client can, can store it and then forward, right? Um, so um, at the broker level, um, if we can't kind of forward a, a kind of pu publish an MQB message because the client's not available, the, the broker will, will store the data at the broker. And when the client's available, it will publish the, the data up to the subscribing clients. Um, and typically for, with clients, it will happen the same way. The client will, will be able to store the data um, and forward the data when, when the network comes back on. Yeah, exactly. We have the same for the our side as well. Yeah, so and I think this is one of the real yeah. benefits of, of an MQT and spark plug system, right? Is is um, it's it's a it's not a polling system. You're not pulling. You're it's a a publish subscribe system. So and yeah, uh, yes. Since I'm back, I'd like just to <laughs> how was my audio cut out for a couple of minutes. <laughs> I just want to add in the talk to make sure two questions that were very interesting were fully replied. Uh, one about managing uh, deployment with, when you have hundreds of devices. Uh, we have the open.NET API to automate that process. So we have a template application that you can use to customize your own enterprise requirements. But everything regarding updates, the such soft products at the device, at the devices, as well download new versions of the application or doing anything you need to remote manage those devices, you can do through an open.NET API and they have some application templates for you to customize and automate your process when you have hundreds of devices. And those .NET APIs, they also allow you to monitor which application, which version, the basic status of the edge devices at the application level, okay? And the other question about mm. storing data on the edge, I think you got that they saying, yes, of course, that's possible. And in fact, in many applications, I must confess, I will not do it exactly the way I did the demo, because if I'm publishing data to hide and kill, and therefore, I'm still to Canary. We can do that, of course, but our edge devices can publish a real time data to Hive and Kill and put the stored data directly from the edge of the Canary enterprise <laughs> using storage forwards and all those protections. So, what we need to do in a layout of project. For sure, uh, the main namespace, the unified namespace and real-time data is on Hive and Kill. <laughs> That's a big master of the project. But SQL data, historical data, many times makes sense to route directly from the edge to the final storage of that information, uh, taking out a little of overhead from the broker. Another question that I lost here that was important. Mm -hmm. Any other question that? No, 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 no. I, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. I think uh, so. Dave and Dave and Eric were able to help with with, with the rest. And and, okay. and for, unfortunately, I think I think we're kind of at, at the the end of our, our time um, here. So um, okay. so I think uh, so we didn't get to all the questions. Um, certainly, if if you have a question, please follow up. Um, we'll be sending you out an email um, to with a, a link to the recording, um, link to the presentation slides material. Um, and if you ha have a question, um, feel free to come back to us, um, and we'll, we'll we'll definitely try and try and get get it answered. Okay, so um, so I'd like to thank um, the all the guys at at Tatsoft. So, so Mark in particular, thank you for 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 the great uh, presentation, and Dave and Erica, thank you for for your help with with the, the questions. Um, it was uh, really great, and I'm certainly looking forward to our collaboration, our partnership together. Um, thank you. Yeah, with with our with many many uh, mutual customers okay all right take care everyone <laughs> and um we'll we'll, we'll talk to you bye-bye thanks everyone bye uh,